Hi, I'm James Verdeer, and welcome to the American Institute of Biological Sciences Bioscience Talks, which is a forum for integrating the life sciences. For today's episode, I'm joined by Drs. Thomas Larson and Patrick Roberts, who are both from the Max Planck Institute of the Science of Human History. They'll tell you a little bit more about what they work on specifically in just a moment, uh, but I wanted to introduce our topic for the day, which is the use of a very modern technique, uh, stable isotope analysis of amino acids, to learn about something that is not quite so modern, which is the diets of early hominins, who are our ancestors as humans. I learned a lot from this interview. It was a really fascinating chat. So with no further ado, let's go straight to it. All right. Thank you both very much for joining me today. Well, thank you for having us on. We're very excited to be here. Yeah, thank you. It's a pleasure. Okay. Before we get started with the substance of the interview, um, I was hoping you could each just briefly introduce yourselves, uh, tell us a little bit about what you're working on. Um, that'll help our listeners differentiate your voices throughout the interview as well. All right. My name is Thomas Larson. I am a research group leader at the Max Planck Institute of the Science of Human History. We are located in Jena in Germany, and my primary research interest is um, dietary reconstructions and, and also biochemistry. My name is Patrick Roberts. Um, I'm a W2 research group leader um, at the Max Planck Institute for the Science of Human History, and I run the Stable Isotope um, Lab here, um, and we use we like to use different stabilized approaches to try and look at past human diets, environments, um, and also mobility. Um, my main theoretical interest is, is more in, in kind of the tropical world and how our species has interacted with um, tropical forests in the past. But um, I have an interest in, in stabilized type techniques more, more generally. Okay, thank you both very much for that. And um, let's get started with a very general question, which is what is stable isotope analysis? And you know, obviously following on from that, what kinds of things has it historically been able to tell us about you know, early human diets? So um, stable isotope analysis basically works on the kind of classic principle, you are what you eat. Um, and the idea is that there's um, atoms of different of, of elements um, with different numbers of, of neutrons. And so you might have heard of things like carbon-14, um, which is used for radiocarbon dating. That is an unstable isotope in the sense that it, it kind of degrades, uh, decays over time. Um, but we have these things called stable isotopes. So that's like carbon-12, which is the one you will see on the periodic table, um, but then also carbon-13, which is its stable kind of um, isotope um, friend there. Um, and the idea is that these isotopes, because they have different numbers of neutrons, they have slightly different masses. Um, and this means that in physical or chemical or biological reactions, um, they, slight, they interact and, and kind of um, react in slightly different ways. Um, and what this means is that the products of a reaction and um, will potentially differ in the ratio of these isotopes to each other compared to kind of what went into that reaction. Um, and we can use this to then trace various different things back um, through the system. So, for example, there are different types of plants called C3 and C4 plants that differ in the number of carbons um, in the sugars made after photosynthesis. And these have very different um, stable carbon isotope values. Um, and these are passed up food chains. So we can then measure, for example, um, a good example of a C3 plant is wheat. Um, and a good example of a C4 plant is maize or corn. Um, because these are passed up the food chain, we can actually then see this in the tissues of, of say a human or an animal that's eating these foods. Um, and through this principle of you are what you eat, you can actually then see whether a human was eating more of the one type of maize or more of, of wheat. And so that's kind of the basic um, principle. Um, the other system is stable nitrogen isotopes. And, and this is, again, you have these different isotopes that react um, differently through processes of excretion. Um, and in this case, it's as you move up the food chain, you, you sort of see a variation in these isotopes that you can measure. So then you can measure a human from the past and see how much you know, of different trophic level foods they were perhaps consuming. So that's kind of the basic um, idea, I guess. Okay, and what uh, what types of tissues are you examining? Do you you know grind up bones? Are we looking for connective tissue? Does there have to be something remaining that's not bone? You know, what what kind of human remains are being used to do this sort of analysis? Well, I mean, it's any tissue that preserves in the archaeological record. Uh, so typically, that will be uh, bones, uh, where we extract a protein fraction called collagen, and the, similarly with uh, dentin, uh, which also contains collagen. And uh, if the and, and sometimes we're lucky finding hair, skin, tendon, and, and stuff like that in, in the record, but that's less common, especially when we go back to deep time, like Pleistocene time. 
Yeah, and I, I suppose I should ask you: to what eras are we are we looking at when we when we think of you know um, early hominin diets? Is this you know a couple hundred thousand years ago, more or less? What, what's the general range? Yes, yeah, so the, the first hominins are about seven million years ago. Um, we think, based on current uh, evidence, although the, the record is is patchy um, and there's a bit of debate. Um, I suppose the, the issue there is, is that the oldest collagen, at least used for stable isotopes in hominins, is only currently goes back to about 200,000 years ago in, in Europe, uh, in Neanderthal bone collagen. Um, and so the material we're looking at for these earlier hominins is, is tooth enamel at the moment, which is this resistant, hard, um, kind of more inorganic dominated tissue that we have. Um, and there we can only, you know, we, we're mainly looking at the inorganic components. So we're only getting carbon and oxygen stable isotopes which doesn't currently allow us to look at things like trophic level, although there are some new methods um, coming in to, to look at those things. But in this particular paper um, and the, the work we're discussing, we're primarily talking about protein um, tissues that, that we need to analyze. And so for early hominins currently, that's a little bit off limits, although that might change soon. So we're sort of talking really here the last 200,000 years, really probably more the last 100,000 years where, where the kind of techniques with regards to protein, stabilized type analysis of protein tissues is, is, is relevant. Okay, and as we sort of, you know, move into uh, discussing your article in particular, um, why don't we chat a little bit about the difference between sort of the, you know, bulk analysis of, of stable isotopes um, and the amino acid, um, you know, analysis of, of stable isotopes. What's, what's the difference there? Um, you know, kind of what's, what's new in this approach versus, you know, what's been practiced in the past? Well, well traditionally, we would analyze total protein so carbon and nitrogen isotopes of total proteins, but now we have techniques. I mean, they've been developing over the past two or three decades, but now they're becoming commonly available that we are able to, to separate the building blocks of proteins called amino acids. So we separate those and then we can analyze carbon and nitrogen isotopes. Uh, and, 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 and be able to, so there generally there are 20 protein amino acids and we are able to analyze about 15 to 16 of them uh, and be able to analyze both carbon and nitrogen. So that means that we suddenly have these multi-dimensional data, whereas before with bulk stabilized isotopes, we only have two dimensions. Okay, and, and what sort of, you know, additional information are you able to learn, um, you know, from those specific amino acids when you're able to look at those rather than just looking at sort of the, you know, the, the bulk carbon and nitrogen? Well, that, that's where we start looking at nutrition and biochemistry. So, um, so, so basically, we can divide amino acids into two groups, the, the ones that we cannot synthesize, so they're called essential amino acids, and then the ones that we're able to synthesize um, called non-essential amino acids. So the essential amino acids, because they don't change during trophic transfer, when we eat some food and it's passed on to the consumer and predator eating that consumer, so they reflect the base of the food web. So that, that's for, for the carbon part, so for the carbon skeleton. And then there, well, what Patrick was talking about earlier is that it's not the same principle, but there's also amino group in the amino acids. Uh, and for some certain amino acids, that amino group remains conserved. So it, it also reflects the base of the food web. And, and then there are other amino acids where this nitrogen group or amino group readily change during trophic transfer. So the, the more transfers, this amino acid has been through, the, the more the 15N value, the nitrogen isotope value would have changed. And so what does that, what does that allow you to kind of understand about, um, you know, what these, you know, hominins were actually eating? Are we able to then understand, you know, um, they were eating a diet that was heavily biased towards certain plants or, you know, certain animals? What's it allow us to kind of know um, about those early diets? I think one of the issues is with the bulk is that, it, it tells us about food groups, but there can be a lot of overlap in, in those food groups. So, for example, with the carbon isotopes, you know, plants like C4 plants, they can overlap with, with resources coming from the ocean um, in, in carbon isotope space. Um, or, for example, in the case of nitrogen, you can have the changes because of trophic level, but you can also have changes if someone's living in a very arid environment, then everything will also have slightly higher nitrogen as well. And so sometimes we really struggle to distinguish between these environmental factors. 
um, as well as between different food groups. And I think, uh, as Thomas was saying, one of the benefits of, of, of amino acids is, A, you can kind of start to lock down a bit of those environmental changes because the amino acid relationship, if you compare two amino acids to each other, then you can start to see information about trophic level that's sort of independent of this environmental baseline change. Um, but also in the case of carbon isotopes methods that Thomas has really been innovating in terms of statistics, because you have isotope data from more amino acids, you therefore have more information that you can put into a kind of statistical model and compare across different food groups, which allows you to sort of start to potentially pull apart more resolution from the information instead of us talking about, you know, more of a certain type of group, it's possible, although, you know, this is stuff that Thomas is working on, that we could get to a level where we can start to get a little bit more detail about past hominin diets. Um, and so I think it's it's a question of resolution and it's a question of also um, trying to refine our interpretations a little more where we've perhaps been limited in the past. Well, uh, so, so, so basically we are developing a method that is more robust because it's less influenced by environmental conditions. Um, of course, we always benefit from having contextual information. So it's not like this method can stand on its own. Like, like we need as much additional data information as possible. But uh, as Patrick mentioned, with, with, for example, telling marine resource apart from, from C4 plants like maize, um, we are always able to do that with the with amino acids, whereas it's, it's not always the case for bulk stabilized soaps. That makes sense. Now I'll ask a question now at this point that I think will be um, you know trivial to you, but I, but I'm I'm curious about it. Um, you know what's the what's the underlying um, cause for our interest in you know uh, what early hominin diets were? How does this sort of inform? Um, you know, kind of uh, the way we think about diets today, you know, is, is our motivation to get a better idea of what we should be eating? Is it purely historical? Um, what's the motivation behind um, that sort of research? I suppose there are, there are various motivations. I mean, hominin time is, you know, if we're talking about the last 7 million years, it's a, it's a huge uh, span of time. I mean, I guess in terms of the earliest hominins, you know, since since Darwin, if not before, you know, one of the big questions is what, what caused hominin evolution? What, what set us on this path? Um, and in that regard, there's been a lot of discussion of, you know, how important were open grasslands to that versus tropical forests. And that's, you know, uh, an increasingly debated question. You know, it was it was commonly assumed that we kind of hominin evolution was driven by this demand to walk out into the open savanna. Um, then we became more upright. We had our hands free for tool use that we you know started hunting with. Um, but now I think evidence is giving us a much more complex picture of how actually tropical forests remained important, that food use could actually be quite variable. And so on that scale, we're talking about these big evolutionary systematics, right? What caused hominin evolution, hominin variability that eventually led to our species? Um, and then once we get to our own species, I think we're talking about increasing social and cultural changes, you know, origins of agriculture and food production, um, urbanism, you know, how did dietary changes in the past linked to major social change, major cultural changes um, in ways that I guess we still see around us as today. And that's more an interested in getting in touch with food is often at the core of identity. Um, consuming food is one of the most social activities in many cultures around the world. And so by understanding kind of what people were eating, how much of things different people were eating, we can start to try and get a window into social uh, and cultural systematics in the past as well. Right, and, and then there's also the, the big question of, like, humans are generally perceived as being uh, generalist, so we are omnivores, and it seems that we are able to inhabit and exploit resources at every corner of the planet, uh, but, but there are actually a lot of, uh, of these assumptions that are still untested, like, uh, like the degree that we were, we are, were generalist or specialist. Uh, and how much we adapted to the uh, to, to the local environment, and also the balance between plant-based diets and meat-based diet, and 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 getting a, a broader insight into this, and also back to our hominin ancestors, is, is very important to understand uh, our, our like our own predicament today where where we are over exploiting resources and how does our 
present, you know, overexploitation of resources relate to, you know, what we may find in the record for, you know, early hominins? Is it, you know, a case in which we might find that they were, for instance, more heavily reliant on plant-based diets or something like that? Is that the kind of question that we're getting at? Well, well, that's certainly uh, part of it, uh, because the way that we eat today is informed by our past, by culture, by traditions. And and I think uh, archaeology, uh, archaeological science uh, play a big role here in, in providing objective data that can can help us to inform our, of our past and how different cultures have actually changed them. And, and, and so because of the food we eat is very much a cultural thing. It's a, we have cultural biases. And, but, but a lot of these traditions only go back maybe 50 years, 200 years, and, and there's this continuous uh, and often controver- controversial debate about um, uh, what, what's that called, um, the, the paleo diet. Uh, and that has uh, actual practical implications for our human health and also the the environment. Yeah, and I, I think also, you know, getting back to the point that, that Thomas was mentioning, it, you know, sticking to the period of time where this kind of analysis of proteins is more effective, I guess. You know, there have been lots of debates of what makes our species unique. You know, is it is it culture? Is it uh, social groupings? Is it something to do with, with changes in the brain um for example you know one of the first areas where this approach has been applied in archaeology is in with regards to neanderthals and, and humans and it was long thought that you know humans arrived in europe for example and had a much more broader diet whereas the neanderthals were these kind of you know uh, focused on on really heavy meat resources and they didn't really do a lot else and they were really kind of specialized and that what ultimately then allowed us to succeed was our flexibility but but this approach is actually showing well actually hang on it's a little bit uh more complex um, and one of the questions I'm really interested in is, is, is what makes our species unique and ecologically unique? Um, you know, I had a paper with a colleague a few years back where we, we came up with this term, exactly this generalist specialist idea. Uh, the idea that, that we're generalists as a hominins, as a species, in the sense that we're found everywhere around the world by the end of the Pleistocene. But as Thomas mentioned, there's also populations of humans that develop these very specialized kind of adaptations to rainforests, to deserts, to, you know, Arctic conditions. Um, and so it's this perhaps the simultaneous ability that might set us apart from other hominins, but it's really an open question and it needs to be tested properly. Um, and this is, I guess, one method that hopefully allows us to get to get in at that. Excellent. And so I'm, I'm wondering now, you know, um, what kinds of things have we learned so far from this? And that could be, you know, one of the examples of the, of the things you were just discussing. Um, but just in general, you know, what kinds of what kinds of things are we learning from these techniques at this point? Um, and then I'll ask you, of course, uh, what we might expect to see more of in the future. Well, um, I would like to mention a study I was involved in uh, a few years back where we studied uh, the diets of the ancient uh, Rapa Nui, so the, the diets of the people living on the Easter Islands. And so, so that has often been touted as an example of an ecocide uh, because the Polynesians arrived to the island, they probably brought rats and, and they deforested the island. And, um, and it was also assumed that um, these Polynesians were not very flexible in terms of uh, adaptation and they mostly lived off terrestrial resources. And so we applied this uh, compound specific stable isotope uh, technique and we found out that. Um, that these islanders, on average, received half of their dietary proteins from, from the sea, and also that there were clear signs of uh, kitchen gardens that were heavily manured by guano, so uh, fertilizers from, from birds. So that, that, that helped to kind of nuance our understanding of how these islanders were adapting to, to this uh, harsh climate environment they were living in. That's fascinating. So you're able to actually kind of, um, you know, if, if not upend, at least elucidate a lot of the, the details about, um, you know, the, the ways that that island was inhabited. What, what were the prior assumptions like? Well, well it's mostly that the, the, the islanders, they didn't really um, exploit marine resources. Um, and I, I don't remember the exact reason, but uh, the, it was just generally assumed that uh, it was very hard to to go to sea, uh, but our our study 
showed that uh, the marine resource indeed were very important. No, that's a really interesting finding. Uh, thank you for sharing it. I'm wondering now what's next for this research, um, you know, whether that be your own research planned or, you know, more broadly in the field, what kinds of questions are going to be looked at next? Well, personally, I'm very interested in exploring more population uh, across the globe uh, to, to get gain access to, to hominin samples and, and relate that to the environment people lived in, but also investigate population that lived close to, to one another and, 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 and explore whether they use the same foraging and dietary strategies. Yeah, and I think, I think I'm also interested in, in seeing what the potential is of this method in the future in terms of like doing some more, you know, feeding studies, not necessarily myself. I'm just interested to see, you know, what, what comes of that and, and with the methods that, you know, Thomas is, is applying these, these statistical analyses of the results, you know, what resolution that can get us to in terms of can, can we get to even more detail about types of food um, that people were living in the past? I think that's something really interesting and I'm, I'm excited to see kind of how far we can push it and how far we can go beyond this kind of more bulk approach as well. So also I think more foundational work is, is still interesting, particularly in the context of, of humans and omnivores that we don't know so much about. Yes, uh, we definitely have a lot to learn. Uh, still, uh, there's still a huge potential um, because it, there's a lo lot of the underlying biochemistry that we don't understand. We're starting to understand that we can actually roughly reconstruct the, um, the pro relative proportions of proteins to fat to carbohydrates. Uh, and, and for that, as Patrick mentioned, we, we need more feeding studies. We need more advanced uh, models. Uh, such as those developed by Ricardo Fernandez, one of uh, the co-authors in our paper. And, and, and then uh, that's a point we also discuss in our paper that uh, we, we really depend on reference data. So, so ideally, if you could just go out in the world, modern day world, uh, and, and, and sample hair samples from, from people from all over the world, and they all have distinct diets and the know exactly what they're eating, then that could serve as a um, training data, as a reference database. But, but the fact is that now diets are becoming so homogenized, um, so, so that's becoming increasingly difficult. Oh, that's interesting. So it's difficult to find, uh, you know, find varied enough diets to, uh, you know, uh, to train your models for figuring out what the actual diets were. Yeah, because we want like distinct like more extreme diets because then they serve as kind of end members in a dietary model that we can see that, oh, here we have the Inuits eating a um, lot of fish and, and seal blubber and so on. And then we have like um, uh, people from, from India eating solely a, a plant-based diet and so on. So, so we have all these different extremes in, in the um, but I mean, of course, it's to, to some extent still possible. Right. That makes sense. But it becomes more difficult when everyone's eating the same fast food meal. Yeah. All right. Well, that's that's interesting. And I think we've got um, you know a lot to look forward to in terms of uh, future research upcoming. So I would like to thank you both very much for joining me today. I've, I've learned quite a lot. Thank you. For thank you us. so much. Pleasure. And that concludes this episode of Bioscience Talks. Just a reminder, the journal Bioscience is published by Oxford University Press on behalf of the American Institute of Biological Sciences and is made possible by the support of our members and donors. Thank you, and talk to you next time.